Yeah. All right, our next modular is going to be cardiovascular emergencies. All right, we're on quite a few cardiac patients. Live audience. Gosh. Go over some anatomy and physiology of the heart. All right, obviously you have your supervena cavia, which oxygen, poor blood from head and upper body. You have your right pulmonary edema artery, blood to the right lung, okay? You have your right atrium, your, your inferior vena cava, which oxygen poor blood from the lower part of the body, is where all this comes into, and then your right ventricle. Obviously, and then you have your left, left pulmonary artery, where the blood from the left lung comes into. <clears throat> Once all that happens and it goes over to your right pulmonary veins, oxygen-rich blood from the right lungs, that's where it comes into. Your oxygen-rich blood to the head and upper body. Your left pulmonary veins, oxygenated-rich blood from the left lung. Left ventricle and oxygen-rich blood to the lower body. Okay. Now, obviously, your heart has four chambers. Go top to the bottom. Okay. Circulation. Obviously, you have your coronary arteries, your arterioles, your capillaries, your venals, your superior and inferior vena cava, and then your blood. You have your red right blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelets, and plasma. Okay, those are all parts, um, all part of your circulatory system. Um, <clears throat> I am not a heart doctor, so it's not a lot that I know about this, but. Cardiac compromise, obviously, you know, some of the main things that happen is arteriosclerosis, which is what? Hardening of the walls, okay? That's most of the time from the fatty foods that we eat or a history within the family, okay? That's where a lot of this stuff will come from. <clears throat> and obviously, over time, you know, depending on what goes on, um, that's when the hardening of the arteries happen. You start, as you can see in the diagram here, you start you start getting that towards the bottom part of the uh, the uh, arteries, and it starts killing that part of the uh, heart. It starts blackening, and obviously you can see, you know, the doctors can actually see this stuff when they when they do, you know, any of these X-rays or MRIs or different things that they do, and uh, they can take care of it from there. Hopefully, you know, whether it's a bypass or different things like that. And your angina per pectoris, myocardial infarction, which is basically your heart attack, okay? And that's where all this stuff happens and then goes from there, okay? So those are some of the main compromises that you're going to have in a cardiac emergency, okay? Obviously, you know, the big thing is is that if you have a history of, of any of this stuff or, you know, over age or the fatty foods that we eat or different things like that, okay? Now, the myocardial is for a lack of blood to certain mm -hmm. parts of the heart? Yes, basically, in a roundabout way. What's that angina? Angina is, 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 is yeah, it's a part of the chest pain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your acute myocardial infarction, some of the signs and symptoms in, that you're going to get with this. You're going to get an onset of weakness, nausea, and sweating. Okay? Where some of this may come into play is like a hot during the summer, especially down here. You know, a lot of times if you see someone who is sweating and nausea, volume, like, you know, different things, you got to you got to remember, if they were outside working or whatever else, they don't have a lot of fluids in them. They're going to start, they're going to get weak. Okay, they're going to get nauseated, you know, and then obviously they're going to be sweating, okay? So you got to kind of keep that in the back of your mind, but never rule out a cardiac problem with them, okay? Chest pain that is crushing or squeezing. All right, a lot of times you can, you can rule out chest pain if you sit there and you push down on their chest, you know, you push down on their chest and going, yeah, that hurts like that. Okay, well, maybe it's, it's, it's more to do with the muscles. Okay, but you still can get, you know, chest pain if you push down or if they take a deep breath. But a lot of times these people will sit there and tell you it's, a, it's when, that's when you ask them, 
you know, well, what, you know, what does it feel like? Well, it's a squeezing, or, or it's a, it's, it just feels like somebody's stepping on my chest. Okay, does it hurt more or less when you take a breath or when I push it? Well, no, it, it's hurting, you know, just like this, whether, okay, then let's go in towards a little bit of cardiac a little bit more. Pain in the lower jaw, arms, back, your abdomen, your neck, they're going to get all that radiating pain, okay, so that's where it's going to go. Most of the time, which side of the body does it go on? Left, okay, because your heart is towards your left a little bit more is, is my understanding of it. Now, I could be a little bit wrong on that, but I think that's where the majority of it happens, okay. Now, a lot of times, females will dismiss chest pain. Okay, so if you do get a call for, for a chest pain on a female or whatever else, try not to let her dismiss it to the point to where, no, it's not that, you know, it's heartburn or whatever it is, you know. Try to talk her into it and go, look, you know what, obviously there's something going on enough to where you called us, especially at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, okay, and don't let them sit there and go, well, it could be the pizza that I ate last night. Well, yeah, it could be, but if it woke you up from a dead sleep or different things like that, then maybe something else is going on. Okay, so um, some more signs and sim symptoms is um, a sudden arrhythmia with a syncope, which is basically passing out. Okay, your shortness of breath or dyspnea. We already discussed a lot of that. A lot of you know, any time someone has chest pain or different things like that, they're going to you know they're either going to start you know breathing shallower because it doesn't because it hurts less you know and then they're going to be complaining about having trouble breathing, okay? Pulmonary edema, okay? <coughs> Obviously, you're going to get fluid backed up in their ankles and the bottom of their lungs and different things like that. And then, of course, sudden death, you know? Of course, that's the last thing that's going to happen, but... Could be. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's... I mean, obviously, you know, with... Uh, you know, somebody goes into cardiac arrest, a lot of times people have no clue that they have any cardiac history whatsoever. And, you know, like that, you know, if they go into cardiac arrest, boom, they die. A lot of times people will feel something other like that they feel like they're going to go into cardiac arrest or something other else. Who knows? You know, so. <clears throat> yeah, exactly, yeah. We absolutely want some of these other ones, you know. <laughs> All right, some physical findings that you may have with an AMI, you know, or car and cardiac compromise is your pulse. They're going to generally be increased and may be irregular, okay? Remember what I said. I've touched on this over and over again, okay? We are we are too sensitive when, or, or too, not really sensitive, but we, we grab our gadgets as quick as possible, Okay? So you grab that pulse ox, you're not going to know whether or not that pulse is going to be irregular or not just because you throw that, okay? We can see that on a monitor if we had it, but with that pulse ox, you're not going to be able to see that. Remember, grab a hold of that wrist and see what you have. Blood pressure may, be, may decrease, but likely will be normal or elevated, okay? A lot of times, you know, unless they're in the late stages or whatever else, that could be, you know, off the charts. But a lot of times, you know, when someone comes in, you know, and they're starting to have a you know, chest pain or whatever else, take a blood pressure. Well, your blood pressure is, you know, 140 over, you know, 82 or whatever else. That's not too bad. Yeah, but I, well, you know. So keep that in mind. Respirations are usually normal unless the patient has congestive heart failure, okay? Again, or heart disease, I'm sorry. They're going to be able to sit there and they're going to have a hard time breathing, okay? So that's where the respiratory rate's going to be a little bit different. The patient often appears frightened. Okay, how many times have you guys gone into someone and you can see someone there, they look like something's going on, okay? They look scared, you know, especially especially younger people, third, you know, in their late 40s, early 50s or whatever else, it's usually normally been healthy throughout their, you know, their life and all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, man, something is going on, something is not right, you know? They may have nausea, they may be vomiting, um, diaphoresis. Okay, so those are those are some signs, and uh, skin often appears ashen gray or cyanotic. Okay, obviously they're not getting good blood flow throughout their lungs or throughout their body. Okay, so they're going to start getting cyanotic. 
Okay, assessment of the chest pain. Again, we go right back to, to step one with everything. Okay, your scene, sef scene safety, um, your, your nature of the illness. Okay, the number of patients, nine times out of ten, again, it's going to be one patient. You could have two. Okay, we had two cardiac patients the other night. Remember I told you guys, guys that a couple nights ago. It's possible. Spine stabilization if needed. Okay, your initial assessment, general impression, all right, you're going to learn a lot from these patients just by walking in and looking at them. Again, we go back to this other, this other slide back here where it says they're ashen skin, they're cyanotic, you know, if they're nauseated or vomiting, if they're cool, pale, diaphoretic, okay, their respiratory rate. You can see all of this as you walk into the room. You're going to be able to look at them and tell them, okay, something's going on, okay. Their airway, all right, they're breathing, all right. Obviously, if they're breathing, they're talking to you, they have an open airway. Okay, but then you got to turn around and look. What's the respiratory rate? Is it greater than 20? Is it less than 10, 12? What is it, all right? So let's let's go a little bit farther and dig into it. Circulation, grab a hold of that wrist. Tell, see whether or not it's bounding, whether it's spready, strong, weak, whether you even feel one if they're at the wrist, Okay, if you don't feel one at the wrist, but you feel one at the carotid, what's at least the blood, what, it, what is it at least? If you don't feel it at the wrist, but you can, right, okay, so you know, if you don't feel one at the wrist, man, lay, them, lay that patient down if they can tolerate it. Okay, a lot of times, remember, if they're having congestive heart failure, different things like that, laying them down is not going to be a good thing, okay, so, and then, of course, your trans, transport decision. Can we make that decision? No. You know, but we can advise, you know, the medics or whoever else as they show up, hey, listen, man, we got to get this patient to the hospital now. We got to go. You know, we can do as much as we can for them so when they walk in, boom, throw them on that stretcher, get them in the back of the rig, and let's go. All right? Make sure you get a sample history, especially if that patient is alert and awake when you get there. Okay? Because at any moment, that patient could go out. They could fall out on you, and then you may not get anything, all right? So always get as much as your sample history as much as possible. Find out they have a history of a heart, heart disease, heart attacks within the family. You know, find out if it's a husband or whatever else. Do you know, did his father have heart disease? Did he not? You know, what, what is it? You know, what, tell me a little bit about the history, okay? Some of the risk factors, smoking, okay? That's a big one. You can sit there and go, boom, overweight. You know, you can sit there and walk in, okay, well, they're a heavy smoker, they're overweight, okay, you know what, these are some of the things that you don't really necessarily need to know from the family, you can observe on your own, okay, OPQRST, all right, make sure you get that, and then a physical, focused physical exam, all right, make sure you put your hands on that patient, make sure you listen to everything, feel on those, uh, you know, ankles, just because you have a, you know, a heavy set person or whatever else, you know, push down on those ankles. See if you do feel edema or different things like that. Baseline vitals, okay, that's going to tell you a lot as well. All right, and then your interventions. All right, we carry baby aspirin on our trucks. Okay, we can give it. We don't need to add. We don't need to wait for the medics to get there. Give them two baby aspirins. Okay, give them 162 milligrams of aspirins. Remember, our baby aspirins are 81 milligrams. You give them two of them. Okay. We don't have nitro. We don't carry nitro. Can we assist with nitro if they have it? Absolutely. Okay? But again, you go into someone's house and they have nitro, you have to go in there and go, okay, is this their nitro? You know? Go again. Right patient, right medication, right dose, make sure the expiration date's in, and different things like that. Okay? Assessment of the uh, chest pain continue, okay? Your detailed physical exam, you only perform if the patient is stable, okay? If you got that patient stable enough to where you continue to do it, then do it. You know, if it's an unstable patient, you're going to continue to correct the things that you need to correct, okay? You're going to continue to go on that. And then ongoing assessment, you're going to do that if you have a long transport. We don't necessarily need to get into that, but... You know, some of these guys that work for West Coast and different things like that, they're going to have to do that, okay? Chris actually took the blood pressure today. I was impressed. Yes, I did. You know, I was oh, impressed. Right. I okay? And then obviously on serious, car serious cardiac, you know, problems or whatever, we may have to start with a CPR and the use of an AED, okay? All of us know how to use the AED. We're all CPR certified, okay? So, but just be prepared to possibly do that, 
All right, communication and documentation, that is going to be imperative. All right, you've got to make sure you document everything that you do with these patients. Because if something happens later on down the road, you know, when you guys get there, certain things are going on or whatever else, and let's say once they get into the rescue or to the hospital and they crash, a lot of times, you know, especially if it's in the, uh, a younger patient or whatever else, they may sit there and want to turn around and go after someone. Who knows? You know, you never know. But you've got to make sure you document as much as possible. Okay? Heart surgeries. Chest pains should be treated the same no matter whether the patient has a surgery or has a pacemaker. Okay? Remember, a lot of times you'll be able to check. That's why when we do the physical exam, okay, remember that? Remember me telling you about that? You're always looking at it. You'll be able to see if they have a scar. You'll be able to see whether or not they have a pacemaker. A lot of times it's up in the left, in the up left chest. Okay, you'll see that little bump. Okay, but don't don't sit there and mistake if you see a bump on their chest or whatever else up in the left or, or right. Don't just assume that it is a pacemaker. A lot of times elderly patients, you know, they may have these ports, you know, for IVs or different things like that because they've had so they have a hard time getting IVs and they go into surgery. They have a lot of procedures done. Who knows? You know, so don't just so keep that in mind. And then obviously with our AADs, if you do have to place an AAD on the patient, you always keep the pad how far away? An inch. Always an inch away from that pacemaker. Okay, down on the bottom. Okay. AAD it requires some operation interaction. Okay, it delivers a monophasic or biophasic shock. So who knows what our AEDs do? Are they mono or bio? Anyone? They're biphasic. Okay? They're biphasic. Now, can anyone tell me why they're biphasic? What? Nope. Biphasic means that they go back and forth. Okay? Monophasic means is that when they shock, they go from one pad to the other. Biphasic means they go down and back up. Okay? <clears throat> All right, obviously you're going to take the safe and effective use and um, appropriately, okay? We gotta, if we have to shave the patient, you shave the patient if you have to, okay? If they're wet, you dry them off, okay? With our AADs, do we have a special set of pads for adults and children? No. There's a key. There's a key, remember? Now, there are AADs out there that require to have child pads and then some have adult pads. <clears throat> Only if they're smaller. Only if they're small. Remember, if you have a small patient that requires the use of an AED pad and you place them on the front and back and they're touching, then you place one on the front and on the back. Okay, but if the child's big enough to where you can place those pads in the upper, on the upper right chest and then on the lower left, you know, abdomen or rib area, okay, and they're, far, they're an inch apart, then you're fine. Okay, but if they're touching, then you put one on the front and one on the back. Okay, and remember, with our AEDs, American Heart doesn't recognize the use of it on an, on an infant less than one year of age. Okay, again, on most of the time, 90% of the time, if a child or an infant goes into, rest, or it goes into cardiac arrest, what it's going to be? And what's it going to be? Respiratory traumatic related. Okay. The patient must be assessed for pulsiness, apnea, and obviously, you know, can't be breathing, they're not going to have a pulse, and of course, obviously, unresponsive. Okay, our pay, our AEDs do not counter shock, you know, like the, like the Life Pack 10, so you guys don't have to worry about those. Our, our AEDs will only recognize two, two rhythms that they will shock V fib or pulseless V tac. Okay, those are the only two. They're an asystole, it's not going to shock them. Normal sinus, not going to shock them. Okay, if they cannot recognize those two things, those two rhythms, and they're not going to shock, okay? Okay? Obviously, you want to, you know, you're going to go through and make sure the patient's unresponsive, pulses. You're going to perform, perform CPR for two minutes, okay? The only time you shock that patient immediately when you get there is if you witnessed it, okay? Just because you walked into the room and I witnessed it going in, you have to witness it, okay? If somebody else sits there and tells you, I witnessed them going to cardiac arrest, you have to witness it, okay? So, you're going to do two minutes of CPR. You're going to place that AED on the patient. You're, if it's shock them, you shock them, and immediately after it's done, you do two minutes of CPR. 
Remember back in the day we used to check for a pulse and different things like that? We don't do it anymore. Okay? A lot of times it takes a minute, minute and a half for after you give a, sh a shock to a patient for that heart to either get that rhythm back or go back into the same rhythm that it was. Okay? So go back and do your two minutes of CPR. If it comes back to when you do the second shock and it advises no shock advice, check for a pulse. Okay? If you don't have a pulse and obviously it's an asystole or, or another rhythm, move on. Okay? <clears throat> Obviously, you're going to remove the clothes, stop CPR for the analyze, okay? Two minutes of CPR, shock and advise, make sure no one else is touching the patient, okay? Buddy had um, a couple nights, a couple shifts ago, well, actually a month ago, I apologize. About a month ago, he was on the call with uh, Medicaid, and he was doing CPR, and they were, and they were, uh, they were doing CPR on this patient, and they looked over, and the rhythm looked, and it looked like it was it required a shock, and the medic got ready to shock, and he said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we're doing CPR." And then once they realized, "Oh, okay," so it came real close. He almost got real close because a lot of times they get they get caught up in the in the moment, and they'll look over the rhythm, they'll see something, they'll just go to shock. So make sure that you 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 keep that in the back of your mind, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, and lastly, repeat the cycle of administering one shock and performing two, two minutes of CPR as necessary. Remember, we want to keep doing this until either A, we bring them back, or until either A, they call the hospital and call it, or whatever it's going to be. Okay, there have been many times that we've worked them all the way in, and you get in there, and you're like, you know, I've been working this patient 15, 20 minutes. The doctor comes in, how long have you been doing? All right, call it. You're like, oh, man. So, and then, of course, um, prepare to secure and transport the patient according to local protocols. All right. Obviously, nine times out of ten, we're going to grab anytime we go into cardiac. Make sure you grab a backboard right off the bat, take them in there because that's the easiest way to transport a patient. Okay. Put them on a backboard, put them on that stretcher, and then go in with it. Okay. Any questions whatsoever on cardiac emergencies? Remember, cardiac emergencies can can arrange a tremendous amount of stuff. Okay. We got to make sure that we read through these chapters in these books a little bit because these chapters do go in depth a little bit more on some of this stuff. You know, the 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 slide right here touches on some of the main key points. Okay, but we still got to make sure that we go through and at least skim through the chapters and read up on some of these other things because it will touch on other things. All right. Any questions for anybody? All right. Let's get ready and take another test.